chapter five of fuel of fire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org fuel of fire by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter five anthony's suggestion what is greater than the king perfect knowledge of a thing what than state is more immense of a surety common sense all the next day nancy went about singing and making melody in her heart there is something strangely delightful in the beginning of anything in the early dawn of fresh joy while the new-born interest is as yet too nebulous to have attached to itself the inevitable cares and responsibilities which cannot fail to come later when the object of our regard is already dear enough to make us happy by being present but not yet sufficiently dear to make us miserable by going away a land where everlasting spring abides means something far more than eternally green fields and budding trees it means a land where disillusionment can never brush away the dew of the morning and where the pearly haze of dawn shall never be dispersed behold i make all things new does not prophesy that once and for all the house not made with hands shall be refurnished according to the latest improvements nay it rather foretells that the mystic gladness of spring and of morning shall no longer be the transient delight which now it is but shall become a part of that everlasting joy which shall one day crown the heads of those who are counted worthy to attain unto it the first dawn of love was just now transfiguring the world for nancy burton later on the sorrow came which is the inseparable companion of all earthly bliss but at present lawrence appeared to her as the embodiment of human happiness in later days she laughed bitterly at the remembrance of how marvellously happy she believed she was going to be before disappointment had taught her how little it is wise to expect from life but as yet all things were hers because she was gradually making the wonderful discovery that discovery whereby the most ordinary mortals for once in their life throw columbus into the shade that she loved and was loved in return possibly if the immortal christopher had penetrated a little further into the future if he had foreseen the horror of the great american war for which he was paving the way he would have turned his galleon round and gone ingloriously home again and in the same way if all the women who make the other great discovery could perceive what heart-burnings and heart-rendings they were thereby preparing for themselves they too would turn affrighted from the unknown land but if columbus had seen further still if he had seen the mighty kingdom which was to grow up on the farther shore of that sea of blood filling the earth with its knowledge and glory he would have gone on rejoicing and unafraid and likewise if those fond souls who are preparing for their own footsteps the sorrowful way could see the very end of the road they too would go hopefully forward knowing that only such as have sown in tears shall reap the full joy of the eternal harvest nancy was too happy to stay indoors so she walked down in the morning to ways hall to see fate on her way she met lady alicia good morning dear miss burton said her ladyship in whom the neighbourly spirit had not yet evaporated may i turn and walk with you i am taking my daily constitutional which i always think is so very very necessary if one wishes to be kept in health and health is so very beautiful don't you think i don't know about its being beautiful but it is very jolly nancy replied trying hard to remember that lady alicia was lawrence's mother and therefore not meet to be made fun of and illness is very beautiful too lady alicia went on i often think that thinness and the hectic flush suggest such touching and elevating thoughts i always wish that it had been my lot to be thrown with people whose illnesses were beautiful and improving to the character 
but my poor dear husband's were quite the reverse tell me about him besought nancy whose thirst for information regarding the house of baxendale was hourly increasing oh there is nothing to tell you my dear he was quite a prosaic and commonplace character so different from me who am simply overflowing with poetry and romance i often think what a pathetic picture it must have been to see a highly strung sensitive young girl like myself tied to a hard-headed hard-hearted man such as mr baxendale but are you sure that he was as hard-hearted as he seemed often people appear unfeeling when they are only shy and reserved and all the time that they seem so cold they are suffering most intensely lady alicia drew herself up my dear of course i am sure is it likely that a man's own wife could not understand him and besides mr baxendale was a very easy person to understand he wasn't complex as i am but just straightforward and matter-of-fact with i am sorry to say a sad habit of making fun of things i am afraid that is rather a weakness of mine remarked nancy humbly then my dear struggle against it and suppress it at all costs to my mind there is nothing so vulgar as a sense of humour it coarsens the finest natures and throws a horrible amusing light upon things which in themselves are quite beautiful and serious and i always think it is so elevating to take life seriously a thing which my dear husband seemed constitutionally unable to do and i fear poor lawrence is not much better before nancy had time to take up the cudgels on lawrence's behalf she and lady alicia had reached the door of ways hall but all the same her heart was hot within her as she realized how completely his mother misunderstood him and she longed passionately to make up to him in some way for all that he had missed in life suddenly she realized by what means she could not say how much the sensitive father and son had been to each other and what a terrible blank the death of his father had left in the life of lawrence baxendale when women of the nancy burton type admire a man they are fairly safe it is only when they begin to pity him that their hearts are in jeopardy mrs fairfax and faith were sitting out on the veranda at the back of the house and their visitors joined them there the veranda at ways hall was quite an institution faith and her mother principally lived in it for the greater part of the year it occupied the whole length of the house on the south side and had a stone roof supported by handsome stone pillars each end was of glass lined with rows of rare plants in pots so that there was no admittance to any manner of wind save a south one while all the sunshine in the garden collected itself in the veranda as cream collects itself at the top of a can of milk therefore there were few days in the year when the veranda at ways hall was not suitable for habitation mrs fairfax and faith loved their garden and in return their garden educated them as only well-loved gardens can educate men and women the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches find a powerful antidote in a garden for those who abide near the heart of nature learn from her lessons of peace and patience which she does not teach to her more bustling children now as of old the lord god walks in the garden in the cool of the day and communes with them who have ears to hear and well for those who hearken unto his voice as it speaks to them through the trees of the garden and the flowers of the field of laws that cannot be broken and of promises that must be fulfilled i have made a new fernery said mrs fairfax after she had greeted her visitors in her old-world manner and faith had carried nancy off for a girlish confabulation and i wish you to see it alicia when you have rested a while oh how delightful exclaimed lady alicia to my mind there are few things more beautiful and suggestive than ferns they always seem to me like graceful women who have charm rather than actual beauty and there is nothing more interesting than charm don't you think so attractive and yet so elusive i have arranged that all the water from the garden should drain into the fernery and so run into the lake continued mrs fairfax 
lady alicia and the mistress of ways hall always enjoyed a conversation with each other for the good reason that each talked of her own concerns utterly regardless of what the other was saying which resulted in the equal satisfaction of both and flowers are suggestive too lady alicia went on i once had a beautiful idea that it would be so sweet for people to try and copy the flowers which grow in the month when their birthdays are it has the same effect as a dropping well the water trickles down a rockery covered with ferns and forms itself into a stream at the bottom that is why i am always so much interested to find out in what month people's birthdays fall then i know what type of character they should aim at and it is so sweet to have an aim in life i think it gives one something to think of in the winter evenings and on sundays and over the stream i have built a rustic wooden bridge it is extremely pretty now and will be far more so when the creepers which i have trained over it are fully grown my birthday you see is in october and i have always tried to copy chrysanthemums by dressing in those sweet art shades and by showing myself a friend for dark and cold days rather than for sunny ones that is so touching in chrysanthemums i think they come just when one is sad and lonely and the bedding out plants are all gone and that is such a beautiful allegory of friendship to visit people when they are in trouble rather than in their prosperous days i am not sure whether i shall be able to keep some of the ferns out of doors all the winter i fear it would be a risk for those that i brought from abroad and even for some of those that came from devonshire you see the frosts here are somewhat severe i remember when dear mildred swain married her curate such a sweet young man with a lovely complexion and no money just like a girl i proposed a month's visit to them immediately in their dear little home and i took my maid with me to show that their being poor made no difference to me exactly what a chrysanthemum would have done in the circumstances remarked mrs fairfax for the first time paying attention to what her companion was saying her ladyship smiled complacently jokes were things undreamed of in her philosophy my dear emilia how quickly you grasp an idea you and i always have so much in common mrs fairfax laughed in her day she had been a greater beauty than her friend and lady alicia's little elegancies were completely lost upon her then continued the latter i think it is so nice for people whose birthdays are in april to cultivate humility and try to copy the dear little modest violets what nonsense alicia if there is one virtue more objectionable than another that virtue is humility it is a most tiresome and aggravating attribute lady alicia fairly gasped my dear emilia i mean what i say there are no people who give so much trouble in the world as the unassuming deprecating people their humility is far more aggressive in reality than the conceit of the most conceited but dear dear emilia think how beautiful true humility is and how altogether sweet and christian i don't care i simply detest it the conceited person calls upon you and comes in and bores you for a quarter of an hour and that is the end of him but the deprecating person rings the bell and won't come in and so you have to go and talk to him in the hall which is always a most wearisome thing to do but don't you think we should rather look at the spirit which prompts an action than at the action itself i always endeavour to do so it seems to make life so much more beautiful and full of meaning my dear alicia it is the actions and not the meanings that give trouble to other people still we should always endeavour to enter into another person's feelings and to look at things from another's point of view then the other person should likewise try to enter into our feelings and look at things from our point of view and if he did he would quickly discover that his humility is not a matter of sufficient importance to entail any trouble on the part of persons to whom his spiritual vicissitudes are incidents of supreme indifference lady alicia sighed profoundly alas how hard you are had you my delicate and refined nature you would enter into the feelings of those dear human sensitive plants and admire instead of abusing their modesty 
extremely humble people always have a little tickling cough you will notice and if there is one thing that irritates me more than another it is a little tickling cough yet i never met a truly unassuming person without one lady alicia was busy preparing a suitable platitude whereby to silence the doubting spirit of her friend when the two girls joined their elders faith and i are regretting that to-morrow is sunday exclaimed nancy sinking into a seat we were planning a picnic without thinking and suddenly the sabbath rose up and hit us full in the face ah i too find sunday rather a dull and depressing day said lady alicia plaintively but i always try to observe it for the servants sake it is so bad for them to see people of our class enjoying themselves upon a sunday so i always stretch a point in order to make the day as dull as possible and after all there is something very english and suggestive in a dull sunday it makes one feel like a radical or a roman catholic or something dreadful of that sort if one does anything amusing on a sunday afternoon i heard of a lovely new sunday game the other day remarked nancy with a dangerous demureness her love of mischief exorcising for the moment her sense of the relationship between lady alicia and lawrence what was that my dear asked mrs fairfax who enjoyed nancy's jokes only one degree less than lady alicia's reception of them the proverbial duck's back clothed in a mackintosh to make assurance doubly sure would be less impervious to water than was lady alicia's consciousness to anything in the shape of humour first of all the men went to one end of the room and all the girls to the other and the girls were christians and the men were heathens that sounds sunday enough said faith it is beautiful dear child quite beautiful agreed lady alicia to my mind there is something very touching and picturesque about heathens and people of that sort i always think of them standing under palm trees on the edge of a river looking as if they were just going to bathe i remember once saying to lawrence that the serpentine on a summer's evening reminded me of missionary magazines i thought it a most beautiful and poetical simile but lawrence merely laughed though i had not the least intention of being amusing but he has unfortunately no eye for the allegorical and suggestive mrs fairfax handsome dark eyes twinkled go on about the sunday game my dear she said well the object of the game was to induce the heathens to embrace christianity good gracious child what will you say next exclaimed mrs fairfax but she laughed all the same not so lady alicia ah how sweet and beautiful and just what should be done in everyday life i think it would be so nice if all nations even the boers and the chinese and dreadful people of that kind were to embrace christianity it might steady them down a bit don't you know and make war quite a pleasure instead of a pain there is nothing so really soothing and improving as christianity i know for my part it makes me feel so contented and pleased with myself all monday and tuesday if i have made an effort and walked to church and back on sunday morning at tea that afternoon nancy regaled her always appreciative family circle with a graphic account which did not lose anything in the telling nancy's tales never did of how lady alicia had received the story of the sunday game after all remarked anthony when their laughter had subsided it must be rather a tight fit for baxendale to be always obliged to keep a tame mother like that hanging about the premises if i had a mother of that kind i should try to get her received into an orphan home or a shoe black brigade or some other similar charitable institution which would take the sweet creature off my hands she must be a trial to him added nora because mr baxendale is so clever himself mr arbuthnot was saying only yesterday that he thought taking him all round lawrence baxendale was the cleverest person he had ever met anthony sat upright in his chair and gazed thoughtfully at his cousin so our dear young vicar is beginning to take people all round is he i shall have to keep my paternal eye open or else he will be taking you all round my beloved nora and then what will mamma and the parish say tony don't be an idiot and nora blushed so becomingly that it was a pity there was no man but a relation to see it can't help it my love we are all idiots in our family it is too late to change as the man said when he got home and found he had received twenty shillings for a half a sovereign 
well anyhow i wish you wouldn't start foolish gossip about me and the vicar expostulated nora mens conscia recti a mind conscious of the rector only in this case it is the vicar but the principle is the same is independent of because superior to parochial gossip murmured anthony nora changed the subject returning to her original muttons mr baxendale was considered an awful swell up at oxford faith says he passed all his examinations splendidly examinations remarked anthony pensively are considered by the uninitiated to be a method of discovering the ignorances of the examined but the initiated recognize them as a means of displaying the pedantries of the examiner mr baxendale has lots of things to bother him said nancy of course his mother is a trial and then he is so frightfully poor i think it is having to pay such an enormous fire insurance that pinches them so do they pay such a big insurance nora asked how horrid as far as i can make out replied nancy they have insured the house and the books and the whole concern for a hundred thousand pounds how much a year would they have to pay for that tony i can't tell exactly as they'd insure the house and the furniture and the books and the pictures separately but i should think it would tote up to something between a hundred and a hundred and fifty a year that's a lot for people who have only about five hundred a year to begin with isn't it it is my dear nancy if i were friend baxendale i'd chuck the whole concern and pocket my entire income myself such as it is but he can't you see nancy explained it's put in the entail or something of that kind that the library is part of the estate and may not be broken up or sold and that every baxendale who inherits the property shall go on with the full fire insurance because of that old prophecy the tradition says that baxendale hall should be burned down first by the king and then by the state and so it has been so the last part is sure to come true also and the baxendales have to be prepared for that and it has got to be burned the third time by something which is thrice as great as the king and the state and a thousandfold stronger and higher i wonder what that will be said nora common sense i should think replied her cousin if i were baxendale i should quietly put a match to the family roof-tree when nobody was looking and so save the annual hundred and fifty and pocket the hundred thousand pounds in addition nora laughed oh tony what an idea it is a very good one but if mr baxendale did such a thing he'd be punished by law persisted nora of course he would if he was found out my dear child but that would be a mistake on his part he should just light a cigarette in the charming old library and throw away the match and the thing is done really tony what nonsense you do talk exclaimed nancy and if his maternal parent was included in the ruins thereof it would be a benefit to the whole neighbourhood added anthony excepting that burned goose quills make such a horrid smell and then he went on to talk equally foolish of other things forgetting his suggestion of arson as soon as it was uttered but nancy did not forget she was not cast in the forgetful mould chapter five